the Archdiocese of San Antonio, Texas. The story of the faith here began with the Spanish mission, was nurtured by faithful shepherds, and carries on today under the leadership of its current apostle, Archbishop Gustavo Garcia Sierra. And what we are saying is we care. God is with us. God is with you. As priests, as, as lay people entrusted with, uh, with the kingdom, has to be about God, not as an idea. God with us. This is the story of the bishops of America, the shepherds of the past and the shepherds of today, who through their callings and ministry carry the church into the future. It's also the story of their parish, their church, the cathedral. This is the chair an exploration of what it means to be an apostle in America. Seventy-five miles southwest of Austin, resting on the banks of the San Antonio River, is the historic city of San Antonio, Sea City for the Archdiocese of San Antonio. The Archdiocese of San Antonio has long been shaped by its location on the borderlands. And the development of the diocese has been shaped by this encounter between empires and countries. And it's through that experience of being a borderlands diocese and these experiences of encounter bringing together diverse peoples and experiences that have really sort of shaped the character of this diocese and allowed for a new, unique, vibrant culture to develop. San Antonio today is probably one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in the country. It's a city that is very deeply rooted in its Catholic heritage, but looking forward towards the future as well. In order to prevent the incursion of the French into the region, who at that time occupied Louisiana to the east, the Spanish set up a number of forts and missions throughout Texas, one of which was the Mission de San Antonio de Valero, which became known as the Alamo. While we often think about the Archdiocese of San Antonio as having a uniquely Spanish flavor, the first missionaries in the region were actually French, coming alongside the explorer La Salle. Their efforts, however, didn't really have a lasting influence on the region, and their presence quickly fades. It wasn't until the 1600s and 1700s when Spanish missionaries coming up from Mexico really laid the permanent foundations of the faith in Texas. The city is called San Antonio, was given in 1689 by the expedition of Franciscans who came from Mexico and the priest gave the name to the river and projected as they were trying to get people together in, their, in his mind, that it would be a group of people here and to call San Antonio. Last year, we celebrated the 300 years of the missions. Even before it was the United States, the United States started in 1776, and the church was already here. And there were people ministering here. And so the missions are really emblematic. They signify a lot. They mean a lot. While they were at the height of their influence, these missions were economic leaders in trade and agriculture. What we see happening later is with the decline of the Spanish Empire and the arrival of non-Spanish settlers, the missions became increasingly secularized. The Mexican Secularization Act of 1833 really did a number on the church. It was passed 12 years after Mexico won its independence from Spain in 1821. And there was a great fear in Mexico that the Catholics would remain loyal to Spain rather than the new Mexican government. And as a result, 
all of the Catholic mission lands in the American Southwest, which at the time was actually Mexico, were confiscated. In 1834, Mexico's secularization laws brought the mission system to an effective end, and the Alamo becomes a military fort. In 1836, during Texas's war for independence from Mexico, a group of Texans attempted to defend the Alamo from the Mexican army. But on the morning of March 6th, Mexican forces broke through a breach in the outer wall of the courtyard and overpowered them. Despite the loss, the phrase, remember the Alamo, became a rallying cry for the Texan cause. Texas wins independence from Mexico, and the secularization laws really get dropped in the area. The Pope then creates the Vicariate Apostolic of the Republic of Texas. The Republic of Texas remains independent until it is annexed by the United States in 1845. The Vicariate eventually became the Diocese of Galveston in 1847, with Jean-Marie Audin as the first bishop. Texas is now part of the United States, and he's faced with this monumental challenge of rebuilding Catholicism in this vast territory. Ancient missions were returned to their sacred purposes, schools were opened, and various religious orders were invited into the area, including the Ursulines, the Brothers of Mary, and the Oblates of Mary. By the end of his tenure, the diocese had 84 priests and 50 churches, and Odin was honored for his hard work by becoming known as the father of the modern Catholic Church in Texas. In 1874, the Holy See creates the Diocese of San Antonio, and within 50 years, due to the tremendous growth of Catholicism in the area, it's elevated to an archdiocese, with Arthur Drossartz as the first archbishop. The first archbishop there really begins his work as a builder. The archbishop works at keeping these old Spanish missions alive. Eventually, these missions go on to become named UNESCO World Heritage Sites, which probably is due, in fact, to his care and attention to them. The archbishop also provided refuge to numerous clergymen fleeing the Mexican Revolution in the early part of the 20th century. He raised over $21,000 for this cause, and he really does all that he can do to alert Americans to the crisis. In one homily, he says, liberty is being crucified at our very door, and the United States looks on with perfect indifference. The ominous silence of the American press and pulpit is not understandable. Another important figure in the history of the Archdiocese of San Antonio was Bishop Robert Lucy. He came to San Antonio in the 1940s. He was particularly attuned to the needs of labor and the needs for economic justice. His father had been a union member and a union leader in California. And growing up in both a union household and recognizing the challenges of the Great Depression really shaped Bishop Lucy's outlook. And so when he arrived in San Antonio, he found the need to speak out on many of the labor injustices that he saw. And he believed that the Catholic Church needed to take a lead in witnessing its own social teachings when it came to the dignity of labor and the need to provide a fair and living wage. Another important figure in the history of the Archdiocese of San Antonio was its native son, Patrick Flores. Flores was the first Mexican-American to be raised to the hierarchy in the United States when he became an auxiliary bishop of San Antonio in 1970. He later becomes the bishop of El Paso before returning to San Antonio as its archbishop. Father Flores briefly dropped out of high school and became a migrant farm worker and worked as a janitor before going on to complete his education and enter the seminary. And it was his own experiences that made him particularly attuned to the needs of the Mexican-American population in the diocese, and also the needs of migrant workers and other laborers. He spoke often and forcefully about the dignity of labor and defended the rights of farm workers and encouraged the church to take a more active role in outreach to the Hispanic community. Father Flores put pressure on the Catholic Church to do more to minister 
to Mexican-American Catholics and others of Hispanic origins. They wanted to see more efforts dedicated to training priests to work in Hispanic ministry, and also to see the Catholic Church invest in the training of Hispanic clergy, and to see more members of the Hispanic community elevated to the episcopacy so they could advocate for the needs of Hispanic Catholics from within. Through its long history, San Fernando Cathedral has been the spiritual home of the Catholics of San Antonio. It was founded on March 9, 1731, and it was planned as the very center of the life of this city. The walls of the old church still exist in the sanctuary of the present cathedral, making this the oldest standing building in Texas. This cathedral has been in place for about uh, 300 years. There is a landmark right there. It indicates 1731. At that time, when this was built, it was with the help and the leadership of the King of Spain. And so, San Fernando, the one we celebrate, was a saint. And so that was the connection with Spain. The Cathedral of San Fernando actually has three patrons. San Fernando, Our Lady of Candelaria, which is the patroness of the Canary Islands, and it was actually settlers from the Canary Islands who built the cathedral originally. And finally, we have Our Lady of Guadalupe, beloved to people of that region. If you've ever visited Spain, you know that uh, as you enter into many of the churches, the reredos, or the altar piece, is usually beautifully decorated in gold leaf with many different statues. So we see the Spanish influence here as we enter the church and are immediately drawn to this gold leaf altarpiece with Christ crucified in the center, flanked by the four evangelists who are indicated by symbols associated with them. So the tetramorph, which is the four living creatures mentioned first in Ezekiel and again by St. John the Evangelist in the book of Revelation. These have come to be associated with the four gospel writers. The baptismal font is believed to be the oldest piece of liturgical furnishing within the church. We think that it was a gift of King Charles III of Spain who became King of Spain in 1759. This is the cathedral of the people and it's known like that. So anyone comes here to pray during the day and, and has helped people to connect with God in, in very profound ways for centuries. In the cathedral, we have confessions already for the last, since the year of mercy, every day from 10 to 5. And this has been very powerful. In 1987, Pope John Paul II actually visited the Cathedral of San Fernando, and this was the only papal visit to Texas. So there's a marker within the cathedral that commemorates that event. The cathedra inside San Fernando's cathedral represents Archbishop Gustavo Garcia Sierra's authority as the apostle of San Antonio. I was born in San Luis Potosí, Mexico, which is at the center of the country. I came from a large family, and I am the oldest of 15 children. I lived all my first 16 years in the midst of my family. My father was not a very talkative person. It was more the quiet side, very committed and very hardworking man, and he dedicated lots of time to the family. My mother was a religious woman. She was always present, very creative, very expressive, very apostolic. I was five years old. I told my parents that I wanted to make my first communion. My mother said, okay, we will see. She asked me, who would like to be your, we call a sponsor for first communion, your padrino. And I said, oh, my uncle, he was a seminarian. So I asked him, and he said, sure, 
I will be your padrino, but I will pick you up every day at quarter to six in the morning to take you to six o'clock mass. So you will get to know in a year who Jesus is. So every day he picked me up for a year. And then when I was six years old, I made my Mejor's communion. We had the mass at the parish. And after the mass, we had a reception in downtown. Before I cut the cake, one aunt, she said, but before you, you, you have your wish today, what do you would like to be when you grow older? And I said, a priest. And then said, oh, now you can cut the cake. Okay. There are different stages of formation. And all begins with, the, in, at least in my order, at that time, postulancy. The, as an order, they wanted to be sure that there was some discernment. And then the novitiate becomes already officially to be included in the order uh, in preparation for vows. And it took two years to take vows, and these vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And eventually you can make final vows, or perpetual vows. And then a few years later, uh, will be a, uh, the diaconate and ordination. It will take about 11, 12 years. My ordination was in Guadalajara, Mexico. Just I remember the, the ceremony, there were many, many priests, and many people. From the mass on, it rained very, very, very hard. Those were like blessings for the months and years to come in ministry that uh, God was going to pour out those graces. As a new priest, I was in San Jose, St. Joseph's Church in Selma, California. In my parish, we were two priests, but the community were four, and we were working in three parishes directly. But we have 17 other parishes that we're helping. And just seeing the, the poverty of people they were not treated well. There were migrants, and there were some with permission to be in the United States, some without it. But they were working. Their work was a noble thing. But it's hard labor, hard labor. Eventually, in the community, in the parish, we were able to bridge, and it became a very fulfilling moment of seeing the communities, people, families, coming together, you know. After years of priestly ministry, in 2003, Garcia Sierra was appointed an auxiliary bishop of Chicago. After serving the people of Chicago for seven years, he was named the sixth Archbishop of San Antonio. It was through Colonel George. Colonel George, in his house, we were in a meeting, and I was leaving for confirmations, and he pulled me into the chapel. He said to me, Gustavo, you had been called by the Holy Father to serve in San Antonio. I remember I called his hands and I knelt and I asked him for a prayer. He said a prayer for me and I left for confirmations. And that was it. So I didn't know San Antonio, I didn't know. And the date the 23rd of November is the feast day of Father Miguel Pro, you know, who was killed by the government in the persecution of the Catholic Church in Mexico. So it became very meaningful. But I just said, I, I would like to address not only the Catholics, but the non-Catholics of San Antonio. And I would like to do it with the Blessed Sacrament exposed. And everyone was invited. I was coming as a bishop of the people of the Archdiocese of San Antonio, knowing that not everyone in the Archdiocese is Catholic. In the years since becoming Archbishop, Gustavo Garcia Sierra has been a prophet voice within the American hierarchy, defending his people from bigotry and racism and reminding Catholics that we are all one family in Christ. We have many people 
who care for the migrants. And it's true, they come, most of them from Central America, but there are also people from Africa, people from uh, the Middle East. There are people from different places that they come also through the south border. Texas has the longest, the longest border with Mexico. So we had been very much exposed to the needs of the, of the people. And so we, we helped them through Catholic charities and other, other groups that are not, not non-Catholics. We provide for some other needs. But knowing the population in all this part of the country, in which there are a lot of Mexicans, Latinos, already the fear that was in them because of, of a, a rhetoric that uh, has damaged bodies, hearts, minds, souls, is, 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 is not acceptable. Most of them, the 97% of them, they were, they were born in, in, in the U.S. I mean, they are not only people that should be enough, but they are our people. And everyone, everyone should be protected by the Constitution, no matter what, no matter what, no matter how conflictive a person could be, there are rights that a human person deserves. And from the faith perspective, being created by God, you know, we should respect that person. And the lack of respect now is is what we breathe, and that is no good, you know, not only for us, but for generations to come. And what we are saying is we care. God is with us. God is with you. As uh, bishops, as priests, as, as lay people um, entrusted with, uh, with the kingdom, has to be about God, not as an idea. God with us, that we can, but by God's grace, go to heaven, you know, and, and not only my family, not only my people, everyone, everyone, everyone.